This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. Come on, come on. It, we call it the uh, the place. The to place be. to be. Yes, it's the place to be. <laughs> then I shall be. It is contagious. It is the place to be, and we are live each and every Monday. Do you actually need a camera for tout, or is it like part of the program? Um, yeah, I like Big Dick myself. I was just the man you see is the place to be. Do you listen at all when I speak on the show? I'm not the one who thrives, thrives on whining about about carriages that are three inches from my fucking car. So if it's too much for you and your big cock of the walk, Knights of Columbus, that cat. When does it end, JR? When does it back end? to the fucking thing, then what do you want? What do you want? When does it end? You're making the poor guy making minimum wage while you're sitting there with our mento going through the coffers. Party people in the place to be. Five years. Five years. We've been doing podcasts. And we have this. This is trash. It's not Austin in L.A. It's not Cabana in Chicago. It's not Conrad down in Alabama. Place to be Nation presents Scott Criscolo and J.T. Rosero. This is the Place to be podcast. To do, to, to do worse than Josh Richer. Place to be Nation. Welcome to another great episode of the one and only Place to be Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Zerk. We're live here on this Monday evening inside the revamped PTBN Studios. I'm out of uh, Brian Kuna's closet. I'm out of the kitchen, back downstairs, feeling good, excited. And uh, here we are for another installment. And of course, joining me as always on this evening is my PIC, Mr. Scott Criscolo. Scotland, how are you? Good evening, JR. So you cleaned up the motherfucking office. And that bitch the- Oksana to clean things out. Oh, God, that bitch fuck out of my face and uh yeah uh, everything's uh cleaned up uh, good evening place nation welcome to episode 514 of the longest running episodic motherfucking gold standard and now it's episode one of the new digs mm-hmm. the new revamped studio a looking forward to seeing it uh yeah. i'll definitely see it in july for st mary's but uh, i might pop in before that um you feel good now? You're not sitting at the bar like in Cheers. <laughs> it sort of felt like oh, that we was were awful. That was a rough, rough two episodes doing that <laughs> sitting up there. I was uh, not not too comfortable, but I didn't mind the Cuna's office too much. But no, it's much better now. I got the got my TV's back. I'm all settled in. I'm not 100. percent I'm still waiting for my table. Ah. Once I get my table, I can sit. Right now, I'm on the couch with the tray tables. I'm a, I'm a little off still, but we're getting closer. We're getting close. Like 90 percent of the way there. But yes, you're getting a new uh, raised uh, coffee table again, or no? Uh, no, I'm getting like a high top table for. Oh, back oh, there you go. Oh, yes, that's right. You did tell me that. There you go. So you'll be recording from there. So you'll, you'll still be like you're at Cheers. Yeah, I, will. Time, I, you know, I, I want to like, be whispering because I won't be in the kitchen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, crazy weekend here in the Northeast. Uh, mm-hmm. We had some weird weather, snow here, there, everywhere. And then just as we get out, because I feel like over the last few years, the big snow was January and February. Like those are the two really big snow months. We may get something November, maybe December. But usually the last five or six years, January and February, were the snow months. And we thought we got away with it. And then last night, <laughs> on March 3rd, old man Winter said, suck a dick. <laughs> and yeah, but March has been – so I saw this on Twitter, and I thought it was a poignant, like, uh, lay of the land here. So, Because you've heard for a while, like, at least here in New England, June has, like, kind of been shitty for the last few years. I feel like yes. it hasn't really gotten nice till like, late June. So I mm-hmm. really think everything has shifted by a month. I think November – is like the new October. December is the new November where it's kind of mild. And then March has kind of become the new February where it's cold for a lot of it. And you may get like a day here or there. And then summer to me is now like become July, August, and September where June is almost like that May kind of crazy, rainy half the time, overcast. Right. You may get a few nice days. But September has been like nice for a lot of the time. Like it doesn't get cold till in almost October these days. So yeah. it almost feels like everything has shifted by a month. Um, we could thank Obama for that and his climate warnings. But uh, I, I really do think it's um, – it seems to be a shift, at least here in New England. And I guess our, we can bring in our third man here. Of course, we are talking uh, the cousin of Saturday Night's main event, the main event. So we can go mm-hmm. and bring in our usual guest for that episode, those episodes. It's Peter Winston, the host of Greetings from Allentown, co-host of the Adams Division podcast. Peter, how are you? I'm doing great. It's uh, it, It's an absolute honor to do this episode of the main event. Uh, I know I know I've been quite a frequent guest on 
place to be uh, recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, it, you know, and, and, it, and it costs you guys because you guys actually compensate me more than everybody else. I, I don't know if you know, it, you know, I'm going to air the laundry right now. Everybody else gets paid in Observer subscriptions. I don't know if you know that to appear <laughs> on place to be. But I, I get my regular going rate. So, uh, but no, uh, yeah, the snow, that was uh, something today. I had my normal commute to work because I don't I can't work at home anymore but uh, credit to the plow drivers of Massachusetts on Mass Highway because it was clean as a whistle out there you never would have known that it was 8 to 10 inches of snow where I was it was definitely crazy we got like I think 11 I saw the max was around I, I think 17 in Rhode Island was the high uh, which is nuts. And uh, but you're here in New England, Peter. So what do you think of my uh, theory that I glommed off of Twitter here of the the shifting of months? Like I, I think the big one of the big ones is the summer piece, where summers really shifted from beginning in June to beginning in July and then going through almost into October. It does seem that way. Uh, I had a theory for a long time that the Earth has been slightly off its axis, and that was to explain global warming. But that's also fucking idiotic. So. I, I think your explanation is as plausible as anything else that I can think of. Because we've had big snowstorms in March, like the last three years in a row, at, at least. I don't remember 2016, but I know the last three years we've had like 10-inch snowstorms like each of those years. And I remember little things, even just like going to the parade in Newport for St. Patrick's Day, starting basketball outside in march and now it's almost like that stuff seems like forget it like it's fucking cold still <laughs> in march um and then starts to warm up a little bit in april it just seems like everything's off just a month and even the last few years like we really haven't got any snow in december much at all and we've had some nice days in december and then like january is where it starts getting frigid so it just seems like everything's shifted maybe like three to four weeks overall so we'll, we'll continue to monitor here at the place to be podcast. Are, you, are you suggesting that maybe we should have a leap month one of these just skip years, things? Like yeah, a, like a, just jump ahead, like a smarch <laughs> or seventeen. Like <laughs> we could just reset. Yeah, that's it. Just, just skip. The, everyone just agrees. So to skip March one year, jump to April, and then we'll be back on track. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that too because I remember. Um, I'll go back like seven years, uh, 2012, because my birthday, obviously, as everyone knows, is June first, and which is of course the birthday of Place B Nation. And uh, that year I was at City Field because that was uh, that night was Johan Santana's no hitter. And I remember being there and I remember June 1st. It was it was it was misting or drizzling, but it was like, I don't know, 53 degrees or something or 55 degrees. It was not like June warm. It was like May. If it like it did feel like April 30th or May 1st, like it didn't feel like June at all. And this was seven years ago. So I, Times I definitely think it takes a while. It we'll takes see a how while it affects. We'll see how it affects Mania, too, uh, this oh, year. Oh, God. <laughs> so, oh, God. We'll see what it's like there. Um, it's funny because for, for 29, for tailgating, it wasn't bad because the sun was no, out. No, it wasn't. And, yeah. like, I remember it was, like, chilly, but it wasn't cold. Nope. It, the show was cold because we were up high, and it, it got very chilly at night. And we were yes. pretty, like, windburnt and stuff. But yeah. Um, so we'll be, I'll be curious how, how things go. I'm, I'm just hoping for no rain. That's it. If we can tailgate, I don't care if it's cold. If, if it's not raining, that's all I'm asking for. Yeah, we got lucky that year. If you remember, Jr., uh, I think it's we got in, we got in for the pre-show, and uh, during the Bad News Barrett Miz IC title match, we it, we got a little rain, like one cloud burst came over. Yeah, and then once we got to the opener, which if I remember correctly, I think the opener was the Shield and yeah, that whole Orton Brian or not Orton Brian, yeah, that whole bunch. I think the the sun because I remember when Taker came out for the match with Punk, the the sky was mostly clear. So I think the, the the clouds had passed by the time we got to like nighttime. I know though. So we definitely got lucky. all the whiners could barely get done posting on the blog and on Twitter's, you know, blogs and Twitter yeah. and everything about the road. Oh, told you it was gonna rain. You know, it's like raining for like you know three minutes in the pre-show exactly. match and never rained again. But yeah, was everyone crazy. was out talking how stupid it was and what an awful uh, what an awful idea and everything else. So yeah, it was anyway. crazy. Speaking anyway, of speaking awful, of great weather. No, was, that's awful, awful <laughs> transitions right there. Where are you headed? I was headed toward Luke Perry passing away, but where well, are you going? No, I was, oh God! Oh, now I was going to get into the show, but we need we do no, need we to talk, talk about, about uh, yeah, so. we do need to talk. All about All right, so let me do that again. transition again because we were just talking off air about bad transitions, <laughs> good transitions, bad transitions. But here you go. Um, speaking of awful, uh, terrible news today. Of course, it broke over the last few days that uh, former star of Nine Hundred Two and Luke Perry had uh, had a stroke and was basically in a medically induced coma. And then today it just popped up that he had passed away. Basically, too much damage was suffered during the stroke. Um, 
you know, rattled. Then out of two and oh bros, and out of two bro one bros. I always fuck that up. Um, mm. It's funny because after we did the talk and pop episode, I went to promote it on some various places, and I joined this like really hardcore out of two and oh fan page where I had promoted it. Uh, one guy said he got ear cancer, but whatever. Uh, so I, I, I remained a fan of that uh, page, and they are like, I mean, it's it's making me even sadder because every time I check my Facebook timeline, there's like nine posts from people from that page, just like mourning uh, the passing of Dylan McKay, and it, it was real sad. Um, you know, he's a guy that you never heard too much bad stuff about from a personal standpoint. Everyone seemed to really like him from Hollywood. Seems like a, a cool guy. Uh, you know, was popping up on shows here and there. He was rumored to maybe be doing guest spots on the new rebooted 90210 thing they're doing. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, a big wrestling fan. We've seen him at various events. Uh, it was just mentioned earlier tonight. He was one of the producers for the Ric Flair 30 for 30. So a lot of ties across our swaths of entertainment, Scott. His um, son's in AEW. That's right. Yeah, yes, yep. His son is, is a professional yeah. wrestler, yep. So it's uh, it, it was it was really sad to read about. Obviously, we're die here 90210 guys. Um, it hurts. Uh, it sucks, especially with the timing of the reboot. It almost feels a little bit like Warrior dying or after he came back to the Hall of Fame. Uh, mm-hmm. And WWE, after all that time off, here comes Nano 2 0 off the bench, you know, from, over the last 20 years. And then one of its biggest stars passes away right when it's announced, which is just crazy to me. Uh, and it's super sad. But I, I think it was Tim Cable mentioned in, in one of our chats that, you know, maybe that's the end. For the uh, for the comeback, maybe they all reunited his funeral or something. So we'll see how they how they tie things in, what they do. But mm. um, any thoughts you want to share on him? Oh, well, I mean, he's he's an icon for us. Uh, I'm I'm actually rewatching the show now. I just started season eight, and I, I I pop into our chat once in a while and and rewatching it. You know, I obviously there was major shifts in the in the 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 roster of actors of stars over like between seasons like four and nine. Um. Obviously, season four was uh, – or season five, I should say, because season four was was Brenda's last year. And it felt like Dylan really was the glue of the show for those – like for that year and a half because he left, what, ten episodes into season six mm-hmm. after uh, – what's her name? Died the, the, his Tony. his, bro, his uh, wife Tony, when Tony died because the father accidentally killed him her instead of him. But um, it really felt like – it took them – I have to say, and for those that are rewatching – it took the the show probably a good six or seven episodes to kind of level out before they kind of got back on the horse. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the rest of the show was. And now I'm into season eight, and I'm, uh, I'm you could definitely tell that with some people leaving, and now they're out of school. Uh, I thought the sh- I thought season eight was a little little off kilter, but well, that's one thing. Back, it it kind of shifts from what it was, and like they're, be, they're using the Walsh house in the name, but it's really a completely different show. It becomes about Donna and David and Steve. Because eventually, then Brandon leaves, Dylan comes back. You know, you get a lot to get through still, but yeah, no, um, no, absolutely. But but he but was no, an icon. Right. The, I mean, the tenor, was... when he leaves that first time is, you know, Brenda, when Brenda leaves, it's kind of like the end of like the original era, and then when Dylan leaves, it's kind of the end of now to when we knew it, and it almost becomes a different show, and then it becomes another different show later. So I, there's almost like four different iterations of that show. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, when when uh, I mean, when Brenda left, it was you thought she was coming back, but. At least Dylan still was the glue to the sh- to the show still, but when he left, it definitely took them it took them a while to kind of I mean remember those shows I mean those middle seasons they used to start in the summer don't forget so what normal shows were maybe twenty one episodes or twenty two they were thirty two episode seasons they were long yeah they did a lot so those I mean because they they barely took a break at Christmas so he was really that that season five you know when he got all. You know when he got uh, uh, when he got fucked up on the when he got ripped off by uh, uh, by uh, the the woman the and then he came back all coked up and heroined up and everything and he was in the coma and everything. like that that was huge. I mean that was the glue. While the rest of them were trying to get their relationships and their characters in order, he really was like the the backbone guy. Not 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 Brandon, but Dylan really. And um, and again, it took them a good hunk of that season six uh, before they kind of got themselves righted on the ship and. And I had said all along, I mean, we're not going to make this a 90210 podcast, but mm-hmm. uh, I definitely think that that when they graduate, like I'm curious as I continue to watch season eight, when they graduated from Cal U, I feel like, yeah, the, the show changed. Because I feel like the two schools, West Bev and, and Cal U, were like the backbone for them. That was their their glue. Now they're all, like I said, now they're just all regular people. You know what I'm saying? Like they, there was something about them in school that kind of made them different. And now it was like, okay, now that they're in real life, and I know another year in Melrose Place would end. 
because now this is Melrose Place. It's uh-huh. Beverly Hills p- kids that are out of school. They're just better actors than those at Melrose Place, my opinion. So anyway, it, it was a very sad. Um, when Brenda came back for the that reboot show in the late 2000s, um, there were rumors that he was going to too, uh-huh. and they were going to kind of like shore up the whole Dylan Brenda Kelly storyline, and they never really did. Well, they kind of they so, reference him right that and that she was with him. Yeah. Oh no, well, that's in the last. In the in the finale of Nine Hundred Two, the original Nine Hundred Two, no, they basically say they're together in England. I don't. Yes. In the new series, I think they talk about him a little bit, but they kind of leave yes. it like you know whatever him and. Well, her and Kelly have a kid. Her, him and Kelly have a kid. Right. Um and. Uh, Wait, so maybe yeah, it's not the doesn't... final episode because he's back in the final. What, there's one where they insinuate that he's with Brenda. In London. season seven, is because it seven? Okay. Uh, yeah, because what happens is, uh, for graduation or somebody's part. Oh no, it was Steve's. It was the end of season six when Steve when um what what was the uh, Claire's friend? Oh, uh, no, it was Andrea's wedding. It's Andrea's wedding. I oh, think. it's Andrea's wedding, and it was Andrea's wedding, or it was Steve's graduation party on the yacht. One of those two. Right. And, and they say they Dylan they're together Dylan, in London. Yeah. Right. Dylan get they they get the invitation back from Dylan, and it's Brenda's address. Right. Right. So it's season six. Yeah. Because he that's where he goes after he leaves the show. He bounces around, and then they say he's back in London with yeah in with the finale. Brenda. So it's in the finale. He's there. So. Yeah, yeah, and then I think so, in the new one they talk like Kelly talks about the whatever them splitting up or something because yeah. They, they, anyway, anyway, uh, Peter, anything you want to say about Luke Perry that we haven't covered here? Well, I wasn't a regular watcher of that show, but I mean, it's undeniable that the guy was an icon, sort of like the Arthur Fonzarelli of his time, and it, it goes good you know, comparison. It was beyond uh, him maybe playing a little bit younger than his actual age was. It's, you know, it. Everybody knew who, even if you didn't watch the show, you knew who Dylan was from 90210. It was Luke Perry. So it was something that kind of, you know, became, I don't want to say mainstream because there are a lot of characters that become mainstream, but it felt like that that character was sort of iconic in mm-hmm. television history. It absolutely was. No, I agree. You got to remember, and we and we and I talked about this when we did the 90210 podcast. 90210 was the Fox version of Dallas Dynasty mm-hmm. because Fox was the younger demographic show. So 90210 is really the first teen drama of its time because really what were Fox's big shows? The Simpsons, Married with Children, and 21 Jump Street, <laughs> really. So 90210 became like the backbone show of the network for a decade, and no, he was, was the huge, face of it. Yeah, it was a huge deal. He was a big you star. Know? Yeah. For sure. I mean, everyone knew, pretty much everyone knew or was aware of Dylan McKay as a character. Yeah. Um, I don't remember how he did. Was he in our PC Band character tournament when we did that? <laughs> we started the Webster, they were. I believe he did. Yes, um, I believe I he was. I think he, he had to have been. We may have to run that back uh, someday. I know. I think we definitely do. He would have beaten home. So anyway, and let us and let us not forget that he's not just the Dylan only guy. He had the balls to actually be in a rodeo movie called Eight Seconds. That's right. He was. He was. What's yeah. his name? The it was a biopic. It was about a, an actual rodeo rider. I can't remember his name, but yeah, Lane something I think. Yeah, and then he was on uh, Riverdale. Yep, recently. Yeah, so, yeah. All right, Luke. Uh, R.I.P. Uh, you'll live on forever in the Nintendo world, and hopefully we'll see how they uh, we'll see how the things fall in the new show with with him on there. So, all there right, a lot Scott. of deaths today it was not fun. <laughs> Hall of Fame hockey. I mean. Uh, uh, Peter, Hall of Fame hockey player Ted Lindsay died, part of the one of the greatest uh, front lines in NHL history. And he the guy who today. started the Players Association as well, so he was instrumental in, in that regard and yeah. helping the players. And then the lead singer of Prodigy died today, too. Yes. So, so tough day today, tough day. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about the death of the Mega Powers, mm-hmm. which was more mm-hmm. devastating than any other did. No. Um, tonight, as we mentioned, of course, with Peter here, we're going back to February 3rd. 1989 from the actually brand spanking new uh, Bradley Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So the Mecca, I don't know if it was shut down. No, the Mecca stayed open for a while. But uh, this was the a shiny new toy, um, the Bradley Center. Mecca uh, is actually still open, believe it or not. The three arenas are all side by side in downtown Milwaukee. Oh, really? I didn't <laughs> yes. know. Yes. That. That's crazy. Um, for now, anyway. Yeah. Think, well, one of them will get torn down. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure probably the Mecca. It's been, well, it is the Mecca. But uh, the Bradley Center, of course, was the new shiny. I don't know if this was the first event there, but it was certainly very close. It was certainly very close. I mean, obviously the Bucks, the Bucks probably were already playing there for a season, so it was probably not. It probably maybe the first non-basketball event. But um, this is the second main event of the second primetime Friday night show. Of course, a year ago, uh, we had the big Andre Hogan 
world title match that uh, started this entire storyline uh, to a certain extent. Um, of course, no other shows on this night. No one else is anywhere because this is the big show. But there was a, a bevy of dark matches, guys, because this was actually <laughs> – the fans didn't pay money to show up for two matches. So <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have a, be- and a bevy of and, – and not all of these were on TV. A few of them were. A few of them would be on. So did you say uh, the Mecca was the old one? This is the Bradley Center, right? Did you say yes. the Mecca? Yep. Okay. No, okay. the Mecca was the old arena. This okay, is the Bradley sir. Center. Actually, I, I have an update. I just checked. They're, they're actually in the middle of demolishing the Bradley Center. Wow. Uh, they, they started about uh, six weeks ago, I think it was. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, open October 1st, 88. Okay. So, so, so now the building is exploding, literally. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But uh, all right, so the, the cracks that the Mega Power has left are finally <laughs> yes, coming exactly. to fruition. Uh, Eighty-eight, the buck started, so yeah, they had already been playing. Okay, there. so this, so the building right at this point is only like five months old. So, yeah. all right, so here's the undercard, and I'll re- I'll refer to what uh, what shows uh, what matches were on TV. Uh, so here was the undercard: Andre the Giant pinned Jake Roberts after choking him. After the bout, Roberts scared Andre from the ring with Damian. So that that storyline continues. Original. Original. The, Rouge- <laughs> yes. the Rougeos defeated the Hart Foundation when the special referee Brother Love counted the pinfall on Brett via a Raymond roll-up into a bridge, even though Hart had his shoulder up. After the bout, Brett and uh, the uh, hitman and the anvil hit the Hart hat tack on Brother Love. And that's actually on Best of the WWF Volume 20. Oh. Is that match. Uh, this episode's on a primetime wrestling from June – uh, later on in the year, uh, your intercontinental champion, the Ultimate Warrior, pinned Greg Valentine at 343 with a clothesline after press slamming Hart into uh, Valentine and then hitting the challenger with his own shin guard. God, poor hammer. That is not, not even four minutes. On, I know. On show. Yeah. Okay. I know. He did get and warmed up. I know. Yeah, and that's on the. Like oh, yeah, three, yeah, not even close four minutes. And he, he asked, hey, Look, Warrior, can you go another 25 before I'm ready? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. Um,. Uh, this was on the primetime face-to-face special, JR, which is a show that we'll be talking about mm-hmm. down the line. Uh, your tag team champions, Demolition, defeated the Powers of Pain via disqualification at 816 when Mr. Fuji threw powder in Axe's eyes after Axe attacked the challengers with Fuji's cane behind the referee's back. After the bout, the Powers of Pain further attacked the champions. And this match was on Best of the WWF Volume 19. So, um, in a rematch, of course, from a, a, a show we did, JR, in our last episode, the Brain Busters defeated the Rockers when Tully Blanchard pinned Marty Jannetty after Arn Anderson tripped him from the outside, which I think it was – was that close to how our match ended? I think so. <laughs> I think that was the the, end, the booking ending for most of this loop. Um, Brutus Beefcake fought Mr. Perfect to a double disqualification. After the bout, Beefcake cut off some of Perfect's hair. Wow. That's interesting. I remember that happening. Uh, Jim Duggan pinned Dino Bravo with useless Frenchie Martin in a flag match. Thank God this wasn't on TV. After Martin accidentally hit Bravo with a flagpole when Duggan moved out of the way. <laughs> so there's your uselessness, JR, of the great Frenchie Martin. Awful. And that was the last match. So uh, so now we go to TV. Uh, this was, this got an 11-6. So I don't think this was nearly as high as, as the one the year before, but still 11-6 is pretty fucking good uh, for a Friday night. And, of course, your commentators are uh, Vince McMahon and Jesse the body Ventura. Uh, any uh, news and notes, uh, Jr. Before we begin? No, I think we're good. All right, we're good. <laughs> I think I did it all. <laughs> we're all right, jump uh, right in. Let's, let's hop in. All right, let's do it. Where are we at? Well, uh, Jesse and uh, and uh, what's big time show, Scott. Big time show on NBC Prime Time. Okay. Second straight year, the Rhodes WrestleMania Red Hot. Yes. Uh, of course, last year was a huge show. Andre the Giant defeating Hulk Hogan for the world title and then forfeiting it over to Ted DiBiase. So you have to wonder whether you're going to be able to top that with this second consecutive February show. And Vince does narrate us a uh, video package on the Mega Powers Twin Towers feud to reset for the potential new audience. Vince and Jesse welcome us in. They set the stage for a big night ahead. Jesse picks the Twin Towers to win and bags on Vince, and they're working a poker motif here tonight to get Mm -hmm. us started. So usually they have a little theme that they work in. Gene right. is backstage talking to Slick in the Twin Towers as they've been staging terrorist attacks on Liz. Huh. Uh, there are three men, and the Mega Powers was <sighs> two, and three oh always beat two. Akeem says he's hungry, and it is eat or be eaten, which ties into some of the conversation that went on today in the live chats. And the Big Boss Man reads the rights accordingly. We then get a video package highlighting the Mega Powers friendship set to a pop knockoff with some heavy <laughs> sex music. <laughs> it was crazy. That was, that was so awesome. It was ridiculous. Was that the original song they used, or do you think that was like a network dub? Uh, nah, I don't know. Knowing it, them, 
It I'm definitely sure. sounded like a Jim Johnston creation because yeah. nothing like watching Hogan get, get beaten with that nightstick as like <laughs> as goes into the big sax solo like it's a yes. Clarence Clemens like whatever. <laughs> oh, it was it was so amazing. Not as amazing though as the Vince uh, read at the top tonight. The Super Clash. Blah 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 blah. Oh, it was so great. It was uh, definitely quite the setup and very, very 1989. Yes. All right. Uh, so where are we now? Gene is with the Mega Powers and Miss Elizabeth. He asks if there's an issue in this triangle of love. Hogan says the love charges the Mega Powers and they'll use it to beat the Twin Towers. Hogan and Liz have the love of a brother and sister. And he and Savage have the love of brothers. And Savage loves Liz like a man loves a woman. <laughs> a lot going on here uh, to digest <laughs> from the uh, Intense and profound. Savage says the towers will crumble. I thought this is a great interview. Uh, really well done and really, mm-hmm. um, you know, this lets anyone who's watching for the first time know what the hell's going on here because these three guys are nuts. They're, they're on the game, and we have this kind of interesting love triangle, which I feel like it was kind of the first time we really delved in, at least that we've seen, Scott, that they really kind of delved into the relationships of these three people. Uh, you know, we, it's kind of been intimated in the past, but we haven't really gotten to it where Hogan views Liz like a sister and basically Liz and Savage are. Bang, you know, banging basically so like yes. we never really like talked about that too much but hogan basically goes into it now i was waiting for him to start singing when a man loves a woman uh as you're talking <laughs> about savage or liz but it was um it was an intense right. promo and i thought it really did well to set things up yeah particularly on this national stage i mean we haven't seen i mean i think it was a way to really because we obviously have seen the miscommunication on pay-per-view at both survival well, the the look you know the infamous look at Survivor Series, and then of course the miscommunication that happened at the at the Royal Rumble. So this was a good chance to kind of keep them tight, refortify it. Hey, everything's fine. When misunderstanding, you know, victims of circumstances, Jesse kept saying, mm-hmm. and everything was fine. So uh, definitely, Peter, a, a great chance to kind of repaint the picture as we head into this big match. And everything that is on NBC is treated like it's its own universe because they know that there are people watching that don't watch superstars. Mm -hmm. They don't watch challenge. They don't watch any other programming. This is the only world wrestling federation product that they watch. So they may just be stumbling into it looking for a prime time show. Exactly. So they want to bring, keep those first time viewers. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So no, great job. Great job to keep people invested that have no idea what's going on. Definitely. All right, and that brings us to our marquee match of the night. It says the Mega Powers, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage battle the Twin Towers, Big Boss Man, and Akeem. And here we go. Huge culmination is viewed on national TV as the Mega Powers try to prove that all is still right in their world. They get a massive pop as they come out. Savage and Boss Man are set to start, but Boss Man wants Hogan, gets his wish. Hogan dominates early and fends off Slick. Clears the ring to a wild pop. Hogan keeps pouring it on. Bossman nails him again. Akeem comes in to try something new, but he just ends up getting battered by both Hogan and Savage. Akeem turns the tide against Hogan, and Bossman nails him from behind to take over. Bossman drills Hogan with a pile driver, but tags out instead of covering, and Jesse's all over that. Hogan escapes and ends up posting Bossman on the floor. Slick tries to tie up Hulk, but Savage kicks him in the face. Jesse talks about how Slick plays more of a role than Liz. As Bossman crushes Hogan with a spine buster for two. Hulk tags in Savage, who gets two on Akeem with a cross body. Slick pelts Savage with the nightstick, and now the towers beat on him for a bit. Akeem chucks Savage back outside, and when he crawls in, Akeem grabs him again and viciously whips him through the ropes, and Savage careens viciously and hard into Liz in a sick bump. Liz is out cold. Hogan's checking on her as Savage skulks around. Akeem yanks Savage in, and the Twin Towers double-team him as Jesse calls Liz useless. Savage fights off both men as Hogan picks up Liz. He's basically in tears. He carries her to the back. Savage stands confused. He gets leveled from behind from the boss man. Backstage, Liz has wheeled to a medic room as Hogan is in tears, holding Liz's hand and begging for help, pleading for God in way over the top. Classic Hogan acting. Hulk says, (laughs) Randy, Randy didn't mean it, I swear, uh, as we cut to break. Back in the ring, Savage is still getting his shit pushed in by the towers. Backstage, Liz is conscious as Hogan keeps saying Randy didn't mean it and he's still in the ring. Hogan heads back to the ring as Jesse says Liz cost him the match and the loss is all her fault. She has no business being out there. Savage dodges Boss Man and rally, shoves him outside and flings Akeem out too. Savage struts over to the corner and instead of tagging Hogan's hand, he slaps him right in the face. Savage jumps over the top and stews and then grabs his belt and walks off as Boss Man beats on Hogan. Jesse's just eating all of this up and pinning it on Liz and Hulk. Hogan hulks up and finishes Akeem with the boot and leg drop to a big pop. Bossman beats on Hogan with the cuffs, but Hogan fights back and cleans house and heads to the back. So, 
Uh, standard Saturday's main event match here, but the angle, of course, is iconic. The heat is off the charts, perfectly executed across the board. The build and the payoff is amazing. Jesse is on fire because he's been so invested in all of this since the beginning, and that adds to everything. The bump Liz took was sick. Uh, he, Hogan's acting, it gets worse as we, as we go here, but for now, it's you can deal with it. Um, and it's an interesting take. I guess we can, we're going to save the aftermath for a minute. We're going to talk about the match and what happened here, but... Um, Hogan clearly kind of acting like a dick in the back to, to Randy Savage, you know, basically doing the, if this is like 2000, you know, he's almost like the current angle in 2000 where he's kind of doing it in a sly way to, even though that's not presented here, but he's basically like putting it on Liz's head that it was Savage's fault, even because he keeps blatantly saying it wasn't, uh, like she's be thinking it was. So the whole positioning by Hogan is weird. Uh, again, if they weren't trying to make him look like an asshole, then they definitely went the wrong way about this. So I went four stars, uh, just because of everything that happens and just the iconic angle that's woven into the match. Uh, Scott, what do you think of the match? And then we'll get into the aftermath. Um, I gave the match four stars as well. Um, the mega power, you know, Savage and Hogan as in-ring workers is fine. But, you know, and we talk about it often, JR, and I know they're your boys. Kudos to Bossman and Akeem. You know, they, just, they just know how to be good heels. I mean, they're just – they know how to use their weight, and they just – I mean, they just level guys. I mean, they, they, they make their, their beatdowns look so legit. Uh, uh, I got to give them a lot of props because they deserve just as much credit for executing the storyline as Hogan and Savage are, and Elizabeth for that matter. Um, they're just so good at just laying laying the business, you know. And Slick, let me tell you something. About, let's talk about Slick for a minute because he he stepped in. And I'm curious your thoughts on this, guys. He stepped in at a time when when the managers were kind of in flux in eighty. When did he come in? Like late eighty six into eighty seven. Yes. You know, and and Blassie was was getting old and he was gone, and Le- Luscious John was gone, and and pretty much you had Jimmy and Bobby, and that was it, really. Um. And so Slick came in, and everyone thought, ah, he's just some. And, and you know, to Slick's credit, over the last almost two years now, he has been he has been spot on as an awesome scuzzbag heel manager, and he has been he's had just as much, um, you know, high profile camera time as Bobby or or Jimmy Hartwood, and these guys have had guys that are champions, you know. So uh, kudos to Slick for for really stepping in here. And really put in this storyline over like you wouldn't believe. I mean, from the beatdown on Brother Love and, you know, what happened at Survivor Series and then the shit at the Royal Rumble. Like, they're just keeping it going. They have just had the pedal to the metal. So just as much we talk about Hogan and Savage, because obviously we'll get a lot into them later. Um, kudos to the to the Twin Towers and Slick. I mean, they were they were spot on, uh, Peter, during the, this whole this whole saga. You know, let's not let's not just give Hogan and Savage and even Elizabeth all the credit. These all three of them need to get credit for for just, you know, really just standing there going, what a fucking mess. Let's just beat the shit out of them. They don't like each other anyway. And just kept it going. I mean, they didn't care what was going on between the three of them. They were all about getting their breaking off their 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 piece. And uh, and they executed it perfectly. Mm hmm. They, they oh. ate the pin, but still, it didn't matter. at that point. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you knew they were going on this show. So, yeah, oh, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned the contributions of boss man and akeem because it should not go unnoticed although akeem falling through the ropes when they tried to do the double <laughs> splash holy shit they could have had a fucking li- death on live television there <laughs> oh my god like the way he fell through you know what i think it I- i've always chalked that up to the boss man he kind of hits the ropes weird mm-hmm. like different right. from anybody else and i think that might have screwed him up he almost so, leans back like with his upper body first yeah yeah and I think that they, they – how often do you see the spot where two guys are hitting the ropes that are that size at the same time? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, they, uh, <laughs> they, they, they deserve a great deal of credit for what went on here. I, I made a note, and I, I was wondering, and there's probably no way to measure this offhand because I didn't – because there's so much of it. Is this the longest TV match in WWF history? Now, I'm not talking about, like, a match at MSG that aired on TV, but – like a match for TV that that aired. So this this ran 22 minutes. Now you mean to this point? Eight. Yeah. Okay. This has been easily surpassed since. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, um, Sean Cena I, has to be I, the record, right? <laughs> I can't think of a match before 1989 that ran this long that's on television minutes. and not and, and not on a house show. Uh, I'd have to check. You'd have to check like. Those fucking young stallion spider matches, <laughs> like they go to draws on prime times. 
Um, I mean, are you counting those, like matches that aired on primetime? I'm not really shows? counting the house show stuff that they okay. filmed for. I mean, even even if you do a time limit draw, that's a maximum of 20 minutes. Nah, sometimes it's spill over 20. Well, <laughs> sometimes it feels like 65. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, for the, pure TV purposes, like not a house show and then aired on primetime, yeah, it has to be. Yeah. Like the longest match in Saturday Night's main event history is 16 minutes on the Saturday show. So right. this clearly surpasses all of that. A couple of things also that are really that forever interest me about this match is the mechanics of the Elizabeth bump mm-hmm. and yeah. how this is live television and she had never really done anything other than getting thrown down by honky where they they executed that perfectly now i don't know how how much they rehearsed it or whatever what savage gets thrown out the ring the first time i think that was the dry run of like all right liz here's here's your spot where you got to stand and i don't know if she's wearing padding or whatever i mean she's not wearing machos like 1974 single a catcher's gear or anything like that (laughs) but the uh, the outfit might have a little bit of you know the normal women's shoulder pads from the late 80s which by the way back in style saw an article about that so the fact that this is all live makes it unique versus anything that's like a non non pay-per-view setting Uh, especially the way some of it is shot like in the middle of the match when hogan carries liz to the back and they get everything framed so perfectly with hogan holding liz savage being like what the fuck in the ring and you get the main event banner in the background it's just perfect and then the get the camera following with the long tracking shot when they're going to the back. I mean, I'll grant you, it's not exactly the restaurant scene in Goodfellas when it comes to pan shots, but you know, they, they did okay with it. Uh, Hogan in the back was not a exactly bit, uh, the RSV prequel. Um, but do you think he, um, yeah. do you, do you think they, they didn't even tell Liz? Like they were just like, Oh, Savage is going to guy knock you down. And then they fucking just did it. <laughs> like, so, cause I mean, I don't, I don't know how you, yeah, they don't they teach them how to fall. Like, like, I don't know how you even learn to take that shot like th- that she did. I mean, just there's no break. There's no. Um, I mean, Savage isn't controlling his body. He's getting propelled into her. Like, I just think they said, "Stand there. You're gonna just get fucking wails." You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think there's no way around it. Butt. I think he hit hit her with his butt so that it doesn't. You know, he's not like elbowing her right. in the nose or anything like that. So but he it's gets still thrown pretty out. vicious. I mean, if you're he getting gets... whacked in the head like that by any part of someone's body, come, you know, 250-pound I mean, thing... man coming at you. I mean, I think the thing that they probably were most being careful with, because, you know, the, the, the padding's not wide. So depending where Elizabeth's standing, where Savage lands on her, I mean, she could snap her head off the fucking cement if she's too far back and mm-hmm. she flies backwards. So that was probably something they had to worry, had to make sure that she was – standing close enough to the apron that when she fell back, you know, her whole body was still on the padding, you know, on the or padding or on the ring and not like her head smacks off the fucking cement or off the guardrail or whatever. So it was definitely I mean, they definitely had to work on that. that that's you try to be spontaneous, but she's you know, she's 100 pounds soaking wet. I don't, like she's, it's not like it. fucking... I don't know how you practice that bump. I mean, I, I think it was just like. You're going to be here, and he's going to fly into you, brace yourself for impact, and be ready. You're like, yeah. one and done. Like, I, I cannot imagine they rehearsed that thing. I mean, how when, can you? That's, it's a vicious shot. Like, I don't think other, than, other than, you know, you, you got to stand here right, right. and maybe do this. I was looking when she was standing over there to see if there was any sort of extra padding in that area, and I couldn't tell completely definitively that there was or there wasn't. Uh, Liz is acting uh, maybe left a little bit to be desired. I mean, she was she was acting like she was completely dead and uh, unconscious. Mm. And then when we come back from the ad break, she's she's awake. And Hogan, uh, he he had that famous blooper where he was asking for the tizime because Hulk <laughs> is such carny. And with the, with all the moaning and oh Liz, oh Liz, like you you think he was with Bubba the Love Sponge's wife back there. <laughs> but for, but Savage knew don't leave Hogan with the, Hogan with your with your wife or uh, girlfriend. He he knew before anybody else. But he was it, in. I mean, it's it's absurd. Well, let's get. Well, why don't we just yeah. segue into what happened after this, so then we can talk about it all. So Hulkster goes to the back. Savage is with Liz in the medic room. Savage is blaming Hogan for everything, yelling at Liz. Hogan shows up, and he and Savage argue over what just happened, as well as Hulkamania versus Macho Madness. My favorite part. It's like 
this woman is like like basically fully compromised. She just got her ass kicked. She's laying there. They both, you know, she's one person's sister. The other one's lover. <laughs> we established that earlier. And they're fighting over Hulk Amadea versus Macho Madness. Hey, so if you're not going to have the dick measuring contest then, when are you going to have it? <laughs> uh, oh, you care about his Hulk Amadea? No, it's Macho Madness. Uh, Savage says Hogan has jealous eyes. He's been carrying Hulk because he's number one. Hogan begs him to slow down. Savage says Hogan never asked for the title shot and didn't come at him like a man because he's jealous and he knows he can't beat him. Savage says Hogan lusts for Liz, and he turns his guts, and he'll beat him one, two, three. Hogan begs Liz to talk sense into him, but Savage pegs Hulk with the belt and slugs him away, calling him big time. Liz goes down to check on Hulk, and Savage says he'll splatter her onto him. Savage grabs Liz and throws her across the room, which is crazy, and then Beefcake makes a save uh, before anyone can do any more damage. Savage throws Pat Patterson, flips over the medic equipment, as Beefcake begs anyone that'll listen to get Savage out of there. Just iconic stuff, perfectly executed, even with the overacting. Um, there's so much to unpack here too. Like the big time stuff is great. Oh, big time. Uh, and mm-hmm. then the savage basically just completely turns on Liz too, blaming her beyond Hogan, uh, is this because he throws her down, which is nuts to see. And then, um, you know, basically saying he's going to splatter her all over him. Like he's basically had it with both of them. Uh, and he's just lost his mind. He loses me a little bit with the, like, I don't know how much sense what his uh, accusations make, um, where he says that Hogan, um, was jealous and basically didn't come to him for a title shot. Like, why did he want Hogan? Like, I thought Hogan was kind of doing a friendly thing. Like, I'd, he should have been angry if Hogan was asking him. I guess unless he's just saying he's skulking around, trying to wait for his moment to pick a spot instead of just coming to him and asking for a one-on-one match. It's a little confusing. But anyway, I'm not going to blame him. The guy's a, n- a nut in a very hectic situation. Um, mm. The one thing to me that stands out is, like, they don't have a lot of help in the room. Like, you just have Liz Hogan. Like, Liz is obviously hurt on this table. And Hogan and Savage are screaming while she's there. Like, I thought we should have had some officials and medics in there sooner. Like, it's pretty empty, right, when it's going on? Yeah. Well, I think those medics are boycotting because right, Vince like got this. the state commission uh, <laughs> thrown out of there. <laughs> so that was why kind of part get, of it. Why did medics get her from the fucking uh, – why, why did Hogan – what if she broke her neck and she's, like, dangling over his arms? Like, you know, it's right, like, right. where the fuck are the, the, the EMTs? Jesus. The one night there's no EMTs in Milwaukee. Damn you, well, Steve Willie. I'm I'm convinced that that is definitely because Vince got the doctors thrown out around the country around this time. So this this was a boycott. That that's my <laughs> way of explaining why Hogan had to actually bring her to the back. Uh, uh, by the way, another great blooper when this originally aired is uh, Brutus Beefcake missing his cue, where <laughs> where yes. he 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 comes in too early and he's wearing a shirt, and then when he comes in 20 seconds later, he's not wearing a shirt. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> which which is, beefcake shirt kept co- coming on and off during this like he he wouldn't be wearing he'd be wearing a shirt and he'd be consoling Hogan and then they come back for the break and he wouldn't have the shirt on he he could not make up his mind the other thing that i loved about this is this the whole scene ends with Nick Bockwinkle mm-hmm. tending tending to Hulk Hogan on the ground <laughs> in AWA country that would be great if Miles drives him which after awesome. After Vince opens the show where he's calling this the Super Clash after the AWA just held a pay-per-view called Super Clash. Mm -hmm. It's basically the final fuck you, Vern, which (laughs) uh, probably completely coincidental and unintentional. I I probably know I did. That Randy Savage promo, again, I give it all sorts of bonus points for being for it being live. I mean, obviously, he probably worked it out beforehand. But my God, the fact that... he did that on live television. It's the greatest heel promo that there ever has been in WWE in the entire history of the company, bar none. At least that's my take on it. I mean, think of, think of the money that, that came, how, whatever the pay-per-view buy was for WrestleMania five. I knew it, it set the record like 700,000 or something like that. So, and, and, and it all, all comes back to this one moment. Yeah, no, well put together, well put together, um, and I mean, it's it's it was kind of strange because Jr's right. I mean, we've been saying that half the shit that they're both saying makes no fucking sense, but when you're when you're caught up in the moment, it's the moment, you know, and uh, it was huge, it was huge. It's always great when Jesse's right. <laughs> Two straight. Oh, he was loving Friday. it. Two straight Fridays in February, and Jesse's just like jizzing all over Vince <laughs> right now. You know, it's pretty awesome. 
He's loving it. Yeah. Hey, friends friends tend to fight over the stupidest shit and, and that's that, that that's how it comes to something yeah. like that. So it it makes sense that uh oh you, you, you have jealous eyes for Elizabeth and the fact that it led to Jesse Ventura calling him the luster for a period of time. Yep, Lust Hogan. Oh Lust Hogan always makes me Lustomania uh, forever <laughs> makes me smile. Just like me and Scott arguing over him defrauding each other's charity to meet Triple H. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, we're just defrauding charities. <laughs> anyway, check out the 2017 PTP Christmas special for more on that. Uh, so, what do we think of Beefcake? Uh, kind of an elevation point here. Have, or do you think it's just he was random? Do you think it's to plant seeds that he will later in the year be part of this whole thing? Or Because he hasn't really power. been fully... Well, yeah, he hasn't fully been presented yet as like a Hogan buddy. Per se, so it's interesting that you know was he just kind of hey, SSF have beefcake running there because he's random and he's here, or is it kind of starting to sow the seeds that he's going to really kind of almost step in for Savage? Because I mean, we know Hercules is here; he's got a match, and he's kind of been like the third mega power a bit in late '88. So I thought it was interesting that they don't have him in the mix with these guys. He's been positioned as their buddy, and you got Beefcake, who eventually will kind of take Savage's place as Hogan's you know right hand man. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, Her- there's, a, there's plenty of busy. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of baby faces. Jake, um, you know, the hearts. Yeah, but I mean, Herc uh, is there, right? Because he's going to match. It would have been an easy. My point is, it's like they almost go out of their way not to have it be Hercules. Because he's there. He's in the arena. And he's been positioned. They tried to do the third mega power stuff. He's been positioned as a, as a friend of Hogan and Savage. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just, it just caught my eye that they didn't use him. And it's almost like they're done with him in this role. And that they're positioning us subconsciously, maybe. To start to get Beefcake in in the role of Hogan's buddy because he's here like say, helping him out and stuff. Because I'm not so awesome. I'm, I'm not so sure it's as much that as it was to try and create uh, create an issue between Savage and somebody other than Hulk Hogan. Yeah, which uh, may may pay dividends down the line. I mm. think. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, huge. I mean, what more? What more can you really say? I mean, it might be the greatest piece of business that they ever put together. It's all downhill from here, guys. That's it. Never again. <laughs> yeah. Pretty huge. Pretty huge. All right. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, digest this and take a break? Um, it's hard to say good show so far because it's been one match, but, boy, it's been pretty fucking good <laughs> so far. Um, when we return. Uh, so, I guess, was the show an hour? Was yes. that it? Yep. It was just an hour, huh? Yep. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Main yeah. event was always an hour. It was always an hour. Yeah, forty. It was. Well, I was curious. Yeah, I guess because it was forty-seven minutes on the network. Because yeah, it ran eight. To, see, it was eight to nine. The main event. Eight to nine. Oh, yeah, and the Saturday main events are like an hour and six minutes. Those were ninety. Yeah, that's true. Well, so when we come back, uh, we will have one more match to discuss, and as Jr. mentioned, involves the Big Herc, and more of Savage and Hogan as well. So uh, we'll be back. But first, new break. No. Oh. Mm. Or the new new. The new new. The new new. Consideration paid for by the following. Place Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have over two dozen podcasts available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceFoundation.com. We now offer them to you on two great feeds. On the PlaceFoundation Wrestling feed, we dive into topics running the gamut from today's WWE to the glory days of yesteryear and the ins and outs of the territory days. In addition to our full-length shows, we also deliver to you special pod blasts on topics old and new. The Place to Be Nation Pop Feed is a veritable treasure trove of great content, offering tremendous shows covering the land of movies, television, life, comics, and sports, brought to you by the most knowledgeable and insightful folks in the podcast world. You can find all these current shows, plus archives of our previous podcasts over the past eight years as well, by subscribing to our feeds on iTunes. And while there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others available at PlaceMation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth stretch projects and more. Be sure to support our site by using www.placetobination.com forward slash Amazon while doing your online shopping. And be sure to join us at our forum at Bigelow34.proboards.com. 
gmail.com for all sorts of wrestling, sports, and pop culture discussion each and every day where you can make your voice heard. We also want to thank our friends at Boneheads Wing Bar, ProWrestlingOnly.com, and TheHistoryOfWrestling.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr as well. PlaySpation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Christopher Daniels. I'm a national treasure, an idol to millions, and I've got the rear that makes the girls cheer. And if you're listening to the Place to Be podcast, please continue because I'm great and so are you. We're back taking a look at the February 1989 main event, an iconic one, a legendary one, and also legendary is all the content coming at you at PlaySumation.com and our two podcast feeds that you just heard about. Busy week over on the pop feed, a little something for everyone, as the saying goes. The Marvel Age podcast, Sarcastic Four, cover the second half of 1969, and then coming off of that, the Marvel Age Masterclass, Ben Morris, he had Todd Weber here. They were looking at the first half of 69. Of course, that show flows off of Marvel H Podcast. Premiere episode of Laugh-In Theater, Scott. You and mm-hmm. Andy Atherton doing a live watch of legendary classic Caddyshack. So let's mm-hmm. listen. Check that out. Yep. You're always on the debuts of these uh, new live watches, huh? You the, didn't you debut on the horror one, too? I did. Jenny and I did that one first, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty funny. Uh, you can be on the porn one with Tim Capel coming up. <laughs> or Steve Bennett. <laughs> oh, God. The Hard Traveling Fanboys back with the new Long Book Hunters. They dive into the death of Captain Marvel. Of course, timely as the new Captain Marvel movie is leaking out. Uh, new Talk and Pop featuring Tim and Jenny, as we mentioned there a minute ago. They're suffering for your entertainment. They did a live watch of My Father the Hero. So that's all that's going on in the Pizza Me and Pop feed over the past week. And, of course, each and every day, more and more stuff drops there. Over on the wrestling feed, me and Chad were back last week with the new Wrestling War Zone, looking at the 12 11, 95 Raw and Nitro, including the Go Home Raw. For In Your House 5, I believe that should be out this week as well. So if you have any feedback that you want us to read on air, go to Bigelow34.proboards.com. There's a section, PlaySumation Wrestling Discussion, and you can find a thread there for Wrestling Warzone feedback. And we've got a few in there already. You can go ahead and leave your thoughts. Chad and I will read those after we review the show. Uh, Scott, you, Nate, and Mr. Willie brought the newest main event. They delved, uh, delved, delved into the top news of the week in WWE. Also did a uh, classic New Japan match. You want to talk about that for a minute? Yes, uh, Steve Willie was uh, the one picking this week, and he took a pair of a very rare, not seen Steve, uh, Steven Regal matches. Uh, one with Shinya Hashimoto in 1995, and one with the Great Muda in 1997. To kind of just eh, talk about a guy that you, didn't, you don't talk about much other than in, uh, you know WWE and WCW. So he wanted to have a little variety. So it was two very interesting matches. I look forward to it. Also, at the debut of a brand new Pod Blast series, Scott, What If Wrestling, featuring Greg Phillips and Nick Duke in this premiere installment. The boys dove into what would have happened if Ric Flair joined the WWF in 1988. So it was a really good discussion. Quick listen, Greg and Nick dove into some potential possibilities, how it would have affected WWF and WCW at the time. And, of course, if you have any thoughts you want to share there, you can do it on our social media or at the message board. And you can also leave uh, suggestions for those guys to talk about in future installments as well. So check out PlaySpation.com as well. We're back up and running, Scott. We were down for what, almost two months, I think, at least. Uh, we had some issues going on with the infrastructure of the site. That has been fixed up, so we're back up and running there. Uh, as March rolls in, of course, including the newest installment, Glenn Butler's Wednesday Walk Around the Web that hits each and every Wednesday morning. He was, uh, I don't know, consecutive, what, seven years or so, maybe, <laughs> whatever it was, six years until we forced him into a break, sadly. Yes. But he's back up and running on Wednesday. And mm-hmm. also, if you head to Facebook and like the PTBN Greatest Candy Tournament page, you can participate in daily polls uh, starting March 10th, determining the greatest candy of all time, champion being crowned on Easter Sunday. So if you just like that Facebook page, you'll see the polls pop up every day. You just vote. They'll be up for, I think, a couple of days at a time. 
give your uh, views, and we'll see. What was there, 185 candies or something ridiculous? <laughs> 128. 128. Are there 185 candies? I believe there is. I'm sure, yeah. 120 sure candies. Off there. 128 candies, so go ahead and weigh in on that. And I believe there's maybe a preview show coming for that tournament as well. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, this week, so check that out. Uh, lots going on in the world of Place to Be Nation. And, uh, you know, Scott, when I'm with you here tonight, it feels good back in the throes of the uh, classic WDF era, talking uh, one of the greatest shows of all time. Makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. Mm-hmm. When I'm with you is also the number one song in the nation by Sheriff. I'm sorry, the number two song, I believe. Number two song. still yep. the same week. Uh, number one is Phil Collins' Two Hearts, and that brings us into the Scott Criscova Pop Culture Corner. I'm going to take a breath. Take a breath, JR. Yes, uh, uh, second straight week. We're going back to the, the new poll comes out the next day, February 4th. This is a Friday, of course. So the previous week, January 28th, uh, Two Hearts by Phil Collins, still number one. Number two, to recap, When I'm With You by Sheriff. Number three, Armageddon It, Def Leppard. Number four, Don't Rush Me by Taylor Dane. Uh, Peter had a Taylor Dane poster. When the mm-hmm. Children Cry by White Lion at number five. Straight Up, Paul Abdul. Mm-hmm. That was her first big hit. Straight Up, now tell me. Tell Born me to be you my love baby. me like a brother and sister or like a man loves a woman. <laughs> uh, number seven, Born to Be My Baby or Born to Be My Brother and Sister by Bon Jovi. Number eight, The Way You Love Me by Karen White. Number nine, Wild Thing by Tone Loke, and Hogan wasn't singing that about Elizabeth, no brother, sister. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. And number ten, and number ten, you all singing this Wild time, Thing with my woman, the jealous yeah. eyes, the jealous eyes singing all this time by Tiffany. Tiffany was number ten. Uh, so there's your top ten uh, in the Hot 100 on Billboard. Number one, still Two Hearts by Phil Collins. All right, three movies, Jr. On this that came out on this Friday. So we haven't had some movies in a while. Uh, the first one is uh hey a nice romantic comedy a rom uh what is it rom-com mm-hmm. titled her alibi mm. her, her alibi, alibi. Mm. Her alibi. Phil Blackwood is an American mystery novelist who comes across a dazzling Romanian murder suspect named Nina, who she arraigned in court in the courtroom he is visiting. Instantly falling for her, Blackwood poses as a Roman Catholic priest in order to meet her while Nina is held pending her continued arrangement. Starring Tom Selleck as Phil Blackwood, Paula Poor is Zakova as Nina, William Daniels, Herd Hatfield, Victor Argo, Patrick Wayne, and Tess Hopper. Also uh, star in this uh, disaster of a film, it seems. Yes. Polina Poroskova, former uh, uh, SI uh, cover girl, uh, swimsuit cover girl. A robust 21 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes gave this a 14% approval rating. Uh, Poroskova, her role here, earned her a 1990 Golden Raspberry nomination for Worst Actress. Yes. I believe at this point she was – I believe she was married to um, – Cars frontman Rick Ocasek by this point. Pretty sure he, pretty sure she was. All right. Uh, number two, Jr. Uh, oh, ooh, one of these one of these great late '80s um, action thrillers with Charles Bronston starring Kinjite, Forbidden Subjects. I'll spell it for you. K I N J I T E. That's what I was going to guess. Good. All right. Hiroshi Hara, a Japanese businessman in troubled marriage. He's a woman being groped in a crowded Tokyo subway. He's fascinated by the fact that she moans silently in voluntary orgasms, but does not cry out or let people know she's being molested. When Hara is transferred to Los Angeles, he has too much to drink at a business party and tries to imitate what he saw by groping a Caucasian schoolgirl while riding a crowded bus. But unlike that woman Hara saw in Japan, this girl screams. Hara runs away but is robbed and beaten by a mugger. Meanwhile, several, several innocent Asian men are beaten by bystanders who suspect that one of them is a man who groped the girl. Starring Charles Bronson as Lieutenant Crow, Perry Lopez, Juan Fernandez, James Pax, Peggy Lipton, Bill McKinney, Nicole Eggert, Amy Hathaway, Sam Chu Jr., and legendary Danny Trejo, his prisoner inmate. Very young. Just like so, Nicole Eggert was probably pretty young. Yeah. Sounds like a delightful romp for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Eggert was a DD in this movie. She was born in 1972, so yeah, she was what? 16, probably when it was made. 16 or 17, yeah. Yep. And the final one uh, uh, is a, another comedy mystery film with a legendary actor. Who's Harry Crumb? Oh, oh yeah. There you go. I brought that up in the chat last night about yeah, when we were talking John Candy movies. It's yep. quite the returns. Uh, the late, great John Candy who passed away, was it 25 years? 
yep. ago yesterday. Yep. So sad. Uh, while visiting a health studio in Beverly Hills, fashion model Jennifer Downing, the daughter of millionaire PJ Downing, is kidnapped. Her father turns into a family friend, Elliot Drazen, president of the detective agency Crumb and Crumb, to investigate the case. Elliot's reluctant to supply PJ with one of his capable detectives because, as it turns out, Elliot himself is the organizer of the kidnapping. To give the appearance of taking the investigation seriously, Elliot offers PJ the services of... Harry Crumb, the last descendant of the agency's founder, starring John Candy as Harry Crumb, Jeff, just Jeff Jones as Elliot Drazen, Andy Potts, Tim Thomerson, Valerie Bromfield, Wesley Mann, Shawnee Smith. Fanny Cor- uh, Barry Corbin, too. Only 30% approval rating on this one on Rotten Tomatoes. Ooh. Yeah. He came from a long line of crumbs. That's right. So there you go. And uh, to go along with uh, Steve Bennett, uh, he thought that this would be a good idea. So I will I will go with it because it's not too bad. This is what made money. These were the big money makers uh, on this week, February 3rd, 1989. What was making the most money? Uh, Who's Harry Crumb was the fifth. It made four point six million that week. Beaches. God, uh, (laughs) was uh, fourth. Uh, 5.4 million. Uh, her alibi actually came in third for the week, so it actually got, <laughs> got off to a quick start and then slowly faded. Number two was Three Fugitives, and the number one uh, moneymaker of the weekend was Rain Man. Mm-hmm. So we'll talk more about Rain Man uh, down the line, obviously. Um, okay. Uh, in the NBA on this Friday night, there were 10 games uh, on the docket. The Celtics were home. 117, 108 winners over the Bullets. Did you ever know that you're my hero? Yeah. Reggie Lewis uh, and uh, Reggie Lewis at 32 for the uh, uh, for the Celtics. Your Hornets, Jr. 108, 106 winners at home to the uh, Seattle SuperSonics. Suck it, Sean uh, Kemp. Robert Reed. No, not the Brady Bunch. Robert Reed. Robert Reed had 28. <laughs> Did you get AIDS. <laughs> <Did he>? uh-huh. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Had 28 for the uh, Hornets. Let's Here's the Hornets roster at this moment. I, just, I have to say this. Here we go. Mm. Your starting five was Earl Curitan, Rex Chapman, Robert Reed. By the way. Kurt Rambis. All right, finish. Go ahead. Uh, Kurt Rambis and Mike Holton. The bench was Muggsy Bogues, Ralph Lewis, Tim Kempton, somebody named Del Curry. Who's, mm-hmm. He didn't have much basketball blood in his family. Ricky Green and Dave Hoppin. There was your Hornets roster. Rex Chat is a JR approved Twitter follow uh, for anyone out there. He is fantastic. Mm-hmm. He keeps doing these blocker charge posts um, where it's basically just like if you're into videos of people doing stupid shit and hurting themselves, you'll love it. It's just he just posts these videos, and the joke is is it a blocker? Is it a charge? And it's just like all ridiculous things that people do and keep getting hurt. So. Uh, uh- I'm sorry. All I can think about is the uh, idea of uh, Robert Reed dunking on Sam the Butcher on the Brady Bunch set. <laughs> Before banging Alice. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, but he's a great Twitter follower. He also tweets – Scott, you should follow because he tweets a lot of cool old like basketball stuff too, like clips yes. and videos and shit. So he, he's really worthwhile to follow. This isn't my Hornets team yet. Uh, I didn't really get into basketball probably it's like 91-ish. Um, so my Hornets teams are still still to come. No, Del Curry will be part of that. I mean, Curry and oh, of course will. Bugsy of course. and LJ and yep. So they were twelve uh, thirty. And yep. on and on. Well, it was this year that they were bad enough to get one of those good picks. Most likely, uh, the Sonics were actually pretty good that year, twenty seven and sixteen at this point. Um, Lakers were one forty to one twenty nine winners over the uh, Kendall trouble. Gill. Kendall Gill is a big part of that. Kendall Gill, yeah, yeah. They, he was well. Speaking of Kendall Gill. Uh, this season, 88-89, he was on that Illinois team that was incredibly good and would eventually go to the Final Four. Uh, the yeah, standing... the, the 92-93 ones are my – Tony Bennett, Muggsy Bogues, Del Curry, Kenny Gaddison, Kendall Gill, Mike Gaminski, Sidney Green, yep. Tom Hammond, Zoe, LJ, Johnny Newman, J.R. Reed, David Wingate. And that's the team I remember playing in, like, the original Nintendo basketball games I had and everything else. So, And then a year later, they had my man Frank Burkowski came over from the Bucks, Scotty Burrell. Right. Um, Laron Ellis, well, Eddie Johnson. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, Romeo Robinson was on that team. So, those are my team. Those are my Hornets teams, 92, 93, 94. And oh, of age. course. I know. We just want to enjoy the fact that this yeah, was right, their inaugural right. season. There you go. Alan I know. Risto, Give coach. some love to Robert Reed. Uh, Sam the Butcher did. <laughs> um, the Knicks leading the Atlantic at 29 and 16. Yeah, uh, Peter, Celtics, 22 and 22 at this point. Of course, this was this no was the Larry. beginning of the end. This was the beginning of the end for Larry's back that was mm-hmm. starting to wonk out on him. Well, that year was actually his Achilles heel. He, oh, is that he, what tore, it was? he tore his Achilles about six games into the season, and they said, yeah, no point in bringing him back. Right. Yeah. So they were in third. Uh, Cleveland led the Central at 33 and 10. Wow. 
Wow, jeez. 33 and 10. Well, that was what, Doherty and Mark Elo. Price and those guys. Yeah. Elo. Uh, the Jazz were leading the Midwest at 27 and 17, and of course the Lakers leading the Pacific at 31 and 14. So with the uh, with the Celtics home, let's take a look and see if uh, who was going on on the frozen pond. Speaking the- of Elo and 90s, maybe mm-hmm. just uh, flash back to eating like frozen pizza. Like I think that's a lost art. Like I know there's like oven pizza. But did you used to like remember like the three slice microwave pizza it was Elio's and I used to get the stop and shop one was better because the oh, crust yeah. was better. Is oh, that yeah. a thing anymore? I feel like I never hear about that anymore. I used to get Celeste pizzas all the time and eat them at work, and then uh, somebody yeah, started rid- ridiculing like me. Digi- yeah. Isn't that like DiGiorno? That's like more like an oven. I'm yeah. talking about like the three pieces, like not like a round full pizza. Like we still make okay. those. I'm talking about it was like the three slice, like individual slice, and you would put it in the toaster oven. It's like the garbage Neil Trauma eats in Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, it's uh, – uh, that, that I remember um, – If you look up like uh, Elio's Pizza, like it was like that. It was Yeah, the... no, definitely. I think Elio's still – I used to get the Stop and Shop pizza all the time. My brother Stop and Shop it. was awesome. That, that was the best yeah. pizza. It had the, the really good crust was on that. Stouffer's French bread pizza. I remember that too. Yeah, you don't remember Elio's, Absolutely. Peter? Oh, I, I had Elio's, but then then I promoted myself to Mama Celeste, and I was I was very loyal. I didn't traffic in any other frozen pizza <laughs> brands. <laughs> it must have just been like I think it was just like Craig cheap Elio. and easy because I remember eating a ton of it, like in like as a early like twelve, thirteen, fourteen, when I was like just old enough to stay home alone in the summer and stuff, and like not to not burn the house down if I wanted to lunch, I could just make make the pizza. So I, I think that was just like a go to. And now his name is Craig Elio. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Craig Elio, totally the Cavaliers. Yeah, the show was delicious. <laughs> All right. There were four games in the NHL on this night, and the Bruins were indeed on the road, and they won. They beat the Winnipeg Jets 4-2, to two, Cam Neely with a pair, Keith Crowder and Ken Lindsman with the other goals. Uh, the Whalers were shut out on the road at Washington, 1-0. Uh, the Red Wings were leading the Norris with 54 points. The Flames, woof, Kelly Nelson's Flames, 35-11-8 and eight at this point, yes. 78 points. Gaz, Canadians were leading the Adams. Uh, with 78 points. The Bruins were uh, struggling that year, 53 points. Because I think you said, Peter, Ray Bork was out. Imagine a, a whole winter in Boston with no Ray Bork and no Larry Bird. I mean, who gave a shit? I mean, you know. Well, luckily, Ray only missed uh, a quarter of the season, whereas Bird missed 98% of the season. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And the Caps and Rangers were tied atop the Patrick with 64 points. And the Penguins were only one point behind with um, uh, 63 points. And uh, we had three deaths, but we're not going to get into them. I mean, we'll, we'll get into who died, but it wasn't anybody overly crazy. One of them was actually a legendary actor back in the day. Um, did a lot of great, um, uh, did a lot of great uh, movies. John Cassavetes, who was uh, who used to be in like the Magnificent Seven, I think he died um, at the age of seven, uh, twenty nine, eighty. He was only sixty. He must, I think, he smoked a lot. Uh, actress Betty Farrington passed away, as did uh, Glenna Colette-Vaire, an American golfer. She died at the age of 86. And uh, that is it for your Pop Culture Corner on this Friday evening, February 3rd, 1989. Harry Crumb in the The wind beneath my wings. That's right. There you go. Wasn't Cassavetti's name dropped to one of those WF album songs? Like by, it was not the one Piper. Was it Piper's or Albano's? I feel like someone like name drops them at the end of those where they're ranting. Or am I thinking of another song? Uh, I think you're thinking of uh, Dennis Leary's Asshole. Yep, that's it. <laughs> he says John Cassavetes. Well, the, the end of that song sounds like the Piper one. It does. The, no, like, it does. Right. You're right. That, I, knew, I knew it was like name dropped in some song. Put the goonies in your nose. You're yeah. right. It wasn't. No, that was, it, was, it was Dennis Leary and Asshole. Yes. So, all right. Back to Milwaukee. All right. It's been a while. Uh, where are we at? Gene tries to talk to Hulk Hogan, but he's not in the right mental state. He's being checked on by Beefcake and a medic. So we head back to the ring for our second off forgotten match on this night, and that is Hercules versus Teddy Biasi as this feud meanders on. Jesse's gloating about how right he was about the Mega Powers having issues and says if Liz wants to be a manager, this is the shit that's going to happen. Herc is out in his new blue tights and whipping his chain around, but everyone's just still in shock. DiBiase snaps him out of it and draws his usual heavy heat. Herc attacks at the bell and beats on Ted before he can even get his mint green suit off. Herc sends Ted to the floor and then beats the shit out of Virgil too. Ted can't find anywhere to breathe as Herc is mauling him. DiBiase finally beals Herc over the top while being choked and Vince says Gene is trying to get words with Hogan. 
Ted runs through his usual offense, but Herc is hanging in and surviving pin attempts. Jesse thinks Ted has to cradle and tie up Hercules to counter his power on pin attempts. Herc blocks a suplex and gets one of his own and then eats a boot on a charge, and Ted keeps working through his offense as Jesse and Vince break down the Mega Powers issues further. Herc hits a power slam, but Ted dodges a charge and slings him to the corner. Virgil wraps a chain around the turnbuckle, but it backfires, and Herc drills Ted's head into it for a close two count. Herc does it again and then hoists Ted into the backbreaker, but the ref is with Virgil. Uh, the ref then goes and takes off the chain along Virgil to bust up the backbreaker, and Ted rolls up Herc and hooks the tights for the win. Fun match, and they did a good job considering what they had to follow. And Herc has been hot as a face. We mentioned him earlier as part of the Mega Powers, uh, but really Ted needed to win here to rebuild his cred. Herc very likely is not going very far when you look at the face side of things. So, like, there's not a lot of room for him. Um, right. Ted has been beaten you know, 18 ways to Sunday throughout 1988. He really needed some kind of win here. And Herc, he was never going to put Herc over. So Ted wins the feud pretty much um, and, and uh, moves on. I think this one's finally done. So two and a half stars on this one. They did the yeoman's work. And, Peter, I want your thoughts on the match. But also, do you think – I mean, when they're filming this, you almost wonder if they should have filmed this first. <laughs> like, they could have aired it out of order. This is taped. Oh, no, was this live, actually? I'm sorry. It was, was live, it was yeah, live. So, never so mind. no choice there. Yeah, they had to go after. So good on these guys for – um, going out there and working their asses off. So you can dismiss my stupid theory and uh, go ahead and think, talk about the match. Well, I'm fascinated of w- following a major angle before the live audience because on, on my podcast this week, I'm doing the Savage Steamboat throat angle. And it's like, wow, somebody had to go out and actually wrestle mm-hmm. right after that. Mm. And to, to fo- follow everything up, I think... It might be a little different because a lot of the stuff happened backstage instead of out in the ring. That that may have had an impact. But you're right. This is as good as it could have you could have hoped for out of out of Hercules and DiBiase. And DiBiase needed the win, like you said. I, I, I I'm this uh, the, I couldn't remember the million dollar belt. I think they were doing the vignettes for it on the weekly TV around this time. But he's not he's not wearing it yet, so I, I'm not sure of the timing. Uh, at the risk of sounding like Parv, I don't like Ted in the green suit, uh, <laughs> but he he sells that atomic drop so great because he's held up in the air and he's kicking right. his legs. It is an that, awesome that, shoot. That, that that was a really fun like spot, it. and like all the miscommunications with with him and Virgil. Netherlands Antilles is a great winter residence, if I do <laughs> say so myself. And this is where we we get. You know, the ultra long game of DiBiase is vulnerable to uncovered turnbuckles in the corner. I think Virgil made a mental note of that <laughs> for, for use two and a half years down the road, perhaps. I don't know. But uh, I, I always try to figure out the point where Hercules started to turn sour, and I don't think it's here. It, it, it doesn't, it, it feels like he's okay for a little while longer going forward. I think Dino Bravo has something to do with it down the line. Herc is but, still uh, on the JT uh, revelation list for me <laughs> so far in, yes. in all of this. I mean, I I don't think he ever turned sour as a heel, which I thought he did, but he didn't really. He was fine. He needed a change, but no, he's still there. He's still pretty good in the ring, and I'm still digging him. Like, we haven't really hit that stretch yet where his matches are terrible. So, yeah, I'll be curious when it shows. The, the one cool thing about this is I, I love the Hercules backbreaker. Obviously, somebody like Lex Luger gets more pub for that particular move. And Her, that's because Hercules hardly ever got to put it on anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he got to put it right. on Hogan for like 10 seconds that one time. And he gets it on DiBiase here. And it's both points where he has to let go. And he never gets a submission over a named guy with it. Which may, may, I'm not saying that that would have made him, but... Uh, kind of, kind of wonder about something like that. Uh, pulling the tights for the win, so you, you give Hercules an out. I, I think this is perfectly fine for what they were trying to do. I think the belt stuff we'll see on our next time we talk to you, Peter, is when they really kind of get into it. So I think it's probably started airing here, but they, with everything going on tonight, I mean, they didn't want to introduce it to this audience just yet. So I think we'll see it next time we're on NBC. Hmm. Um, yeah, I actually gave this match three stars. I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. Um, no, and I think I agree with you, Jr. I don't think we see Beefcake, uh, Beefcake, uh, Hercules downfall for quite a bit. Um, because his next feud is actually that far. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I mean, I think I think I don't know. I think the next feud we'll get into it. Mm-hmm. I think his next feud's really good. I don't have a problem with it. I thought he, I thought it was still pretty solid. I mean, he kind of transitions back to his old issues with Bobby, and we'll you know we'll, we'll document it as we move forward. 
Um, but other than the match was fine. I and I disagree with Parv vociferously. I love uh, DiBiase's green suit. We don't see it nearly enough. Kind of like we don't see the purple suit nearly enough either. Um, we like the alternative uh, outfits. The eighty-seven um, purple. The eighty-seven purple. It, we it got buried. I don't think we ever saw it again. Um, the eighty-seven purple is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I thought the match was good. I mean, D, yeah. But DiBiase needed to win. He had kind of kind of lost some some uh, some of his uh, vigor, and he needed to kind of get back in the in the swing of things because the you know the heel side needed to kind of be fortified um, at this point. So fine, it was fine for for DiBiase to win. Uh, Herc is just going to move on to the next thing. People aren't even going to remember the fact that he lost this match. Uh, people really remember nothing in the last like 15 minutes of this show after what we just watched. So it was just good filler, I guess, uh, to get it out of the way and kind of, from a creative standpoint, kind of establish, you know, DiBiase is kind of back on the on the set in the saddle. Um, but a good match, uh, nonetheless. And, uh, All right, Gene is with Hogan, who's holding an ice pack on his head and moaning in pain. Beefcake and the medics are still attending, but Hogan doesn't talk. Instead, just keeps grunting and storms off yelling, Randy. Vince and Jesse wrap things up. We see Hogan stomping around backstage looking for Savage. She smacks the anvil. Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart in the process who are all lingering around backstage. And that brings us to the end of the night. So why don't we go ahead and get into our awards. Uh, match of the night, I think we should all be in agreement. Yes. Uh, Mega Powers, Twin Towers. Yep. Okay. Although I bet you, I bet you, an actual in ring, if it was on TV, yeah, that yeah. the Brain Busters and Rockers are probably the best. Well, for, yeah. for the live crowd. But I would even say but, yeah, Hercules no. DiBiase was maybe technically the better match too. Um, but with all this shit going on, yeah. uh, I hate to even give that worst match. It feels dirty to do that. I hate doing that on these shows. I MVP. Uh, I'm going with a split uh, because I thought two men really earned it and were integral in. Integral, integral, uh, in, integral, integral, uh, in making this whole thing happen, and that was Randy Savage and Jesse Ventura. Uh, I don't know if this gets as over without Jesse. It's still great, but Jesse is such the stir that straws the drink throughout all of this. He's been the common denominator in the booth through all their big issues, even in the ring at SummerSlam. He's just been a part of everything with the Mega Powers in stirring the drink all along, and here he is just at his best pushing this thing along. And of course, Savage is on point. Um, you know. Hogan and Liz deserve special mentions, but I thought Savage and Jesse, to me, were the two real keys to everything. I'd like to give it to everybody in that whole match, including fucking Slick. I mean, they all did it, but I mean, we can't give MVP to six people, but um, yeah, I'll go with Savage and, and, and Jesse. I mean, Hogan did his best to not totally blow the thing by like, you know acting like he was in Gone with the Wind. Mm-hmm. But uh but Savage and I mean Jesse's just like a pig in shit right now and and, and makes you just so disgusted <laughs> that he's so cuz he's doing so well at it. So, yeah, I like that. I, I'll give it to Savage and Jesse. I like that idea. I'm I'm going to give it to Savage alone and here's why. It's because I think that the story here is so good. You could have stuck friggin' Craig DeGeorge or Lord Al Hayes in there, yeah, and it, and it would have it would have gotten over. Maybe not to the stratospheric. God, Jesse is so good though. I mean, everyone always talks oh, about oh, Bobby yeah. at like Rumble '92 was like an iconic heel commentator thing, but like this one gets lost a little bit. Like you, mm-hmm. everyone remembers the angle, but I don't know if everyone remembers just how great Jesse was here. It's a tour de force as, as far as a heel color work goes. Plus, he always he always fancied himself an investigative reporter, and not just with this. Going back to the Andre reinstatement in late '86, yes, and other things, other things along the line. Like he was kind of the broadcast journalist mm-hmm. that Bobby Heenan always claimed to be. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you're going to give it to both of them, Peter. Uh, no, just just uh, yeah. You know what? I'll give it to both of them. Good boy. I, I love Jesse. So he's so good here. No, he he really really He's probably not going to get too many MVPs, so we're going to give it to him where he can. All right, the Sandy Beach Award for the biggest loser, worst worker. <laughs> I mean, I, I went Hercules, just whatever. I mean, I know you could probably go Akeem, but I'm never going to give Akeem worse anything. Uh, no. But uh, Hercules, I guess, net net is probably the worst guy we saw in the night. But even it st- hasn't been. It's I know oh, it stinks too. Cause, yeah, the match shows like this where there's hardly anybody on. It's yeah. kind of hard to, to give anybody a bad grade, but gotta oh. give it to somebody. Au contraire. I mean, if you watch the East Coast blooper version, Beefcake screwing up his cue, <laughs> taking his shirt on and off. I'm giving the award. To, I'm giving the award to Beefcake Fucking because shirt. because. All right, listen. Usually well, we go with an in-ring worker, but I think because of tonight. Okay, does we're so Virgil limited. count? 
Because Virgil looked like no, his no, normal going, awkward. I'm style. saying we're going to allow yeah. Beefcake because there's so little matches. Oh, okay. And DiBiase and Hercules don't deserve. They've already got a worse match, which they should not have. We could yeah. give worse match to Beefcake in a shirt, but we won't. But we'll go Beefcake for Sandy <laughs> Beach. Beefcake ahead, Peter. versus Continuity. <laughs> what else continuity say, won by count out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Did you have anything else to say about that one, Peter, before I cut you no. off? No. Um, no. Okay. Uh, best moment. I just put Mega Powers Explode. I don't. I mean, all of it. Right? The I mean, whole thing. Everything. The whole thing. It's hard to really narrow it down, but if there's a moment, I would probably would have went Liz getting wiped out, but um, I'm, I'm willing to give it all. All right. Herc, uh, the Morocco award for the most juiced up dude. I went Hogan on this night. I thought he actually looked a little bit bigger than Herc. He did. He definitely did. When he was walking down the uh, hallway after the match to, to confront Savage, he looked like fucking, he would look gigantic. He legitimately looked gigantic. It must have been the camera angle. He yeah. looked huge. This was as close as we ever got between with Hulk Hogan and the Incredible Hulk actually <laughs> crossing because he's taking on now the mannerisms. Although with him yelling Randy, I think he's not yelling for Savage. He's actually yelling what his current emotion was because seeing Liz laid out like that kind of made him Randy and gave him a certain tumescence. Mm-hmm. So that's Randy. that's what I think he yeah. Randy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Randy. Randy. All right. Uh, for the Patera Award, worst hair. Here I went Hercules. He, he's just a mess. He needs to get that crew cut soon. <laughs> oh, it's all yes. kind of wild. Yeah. No. Now, I I actually spent 20 minutes at work thinking about this and and who would get the Patera Award, and I'm gonna go with Randy Savage for it. And yeah. here's why. His right. hair looked like it would never like met any sort of conditioner ever. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ, Randy, put a little bit of conditioner in there and you won't have so, so much frizz and probably split ends. So <laughs> Randy Savage. Showed on this night yeah. Too. Well, the they kept shooting the top of Hogan's head, which Bruce Pritchard's always like, we tried not to do that. And as he's sitting on the table, he's constantly putting his head down. So all you see is like the top of Hogan's head, like for a lot of. Do it. you think Hogan would have been even bigger if he had hair or do you think it didn't matter in the long run? I don't think it mattered. He had a do rag on sixty percent of the time, so yeah, it would it would have helped if maybe he could have swapped hairlines with Dauber from uh, Coach. <laughs> Jeez, Dob. Interesting trades considered. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know, Coach. Uh, all right, uh, final grade. Uh, all right, so what are you doing, Scott? Are you going Hercules or Savage? Oh, no, I'll go Herc. It was a mess. But Savage on this night, I'll give him a one-day pat. We may have to give him worst hair at, uh, at the next house show if it doesn't get any better, but I'll give it to Herc. <laughs> oh, no. There's one constant winner when it comes to worst hair um, over these next few, I think. All right. Uh, overall grade. So last year, I believe I gave what was close to my highest grade uh, for the main event. I went 9 out of 10 for Hogan and Andre. Uh, WrestleMania 3, I notoriously, I believe, was lower than you and D'Amato. Uh, no, me and the model went nine and a half. You went 10. Yes. Those are my highs going into tonight. A nine for the main event, a nine and a half for WrestleMania three tonight. Gentlemen, I'm giving out my first ever 10 out of 10. I think this was the perfect TV wrestling episode. It was an iconic angle. The episode flew by DiBiase and her could have brought it down, but they didn't because they, like you said, Peter, they worked about as perfect of a match as you could in that spot that they were in. Crowd is engaged, live TV, awesome commentary, iconic angle that pays off a year-long story. Like, I don't know what better hour of wrestling you can find than what was here tonight. So I went 10 out of 10 for this one, and I think it's better than um, the main event from last year by a touch. Well, I'm sure that there's some asshole out there who'll be like, well, actually, there was an episode of NWA Worldwide from August of 86 that <laughs> had two title changes. Like, yeah, uh, this this was as good as it gets for WWF programming before, after, then, now, forever, mm -hmm. whatever the phrase is. Uh, I'd give it I'd give it 14 out of 10, but since that's not allowed and that's only for rating dogs on the Internet, I will also give it the perfect 10 out of 10. The, the Nadia Komenich, if you will. Oh, uh, I... she, was a, she was a gymnast, by the yeah, way. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yes. Um, yeah, no, this, this is a 10. I mean, you couldn't ask for even if even if you sat back and knew it was coming. I mean, this was just premier storytelling and premier psychology. Um, not only again with 
with between the two of them. But the awesome job by the by the Twin Towers, just they didn't give a shit what the two of them were doing. They just wanted to they, they wanted their pound of flesh. Uh, Slick was awesome. Mean Gene calling them pretty much calling them terrorists. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the DiBiase uh, match is perfectly fine. The commentary, G- Jesse's just a fucking stud. I mean, everybody's on on this night. I mean, if there's any better way for anybody to sell the big show April 2nd, this is it. Even though it technically hasn't been announced yet, you kind of already know it's coming. Um, this is it. So uh, this was – if you're Vince and Ebersol and they're, you know, and they're a little snuggy at the time, uh, they're, they're happier than pigs and shit right now because an 11-6, big-time numbers. They'll probably have another science main event coming up before WrestleMania. Yep, they so, do. Yeah. yeah, so everything is clicking right now. This is huge. Big, big show. Big show. 10 out of 10. There's no doubt. It's a different 10 than the WrestleMania, than WrestleMania 3 for me, but a 10 nonetheless. Different way to explain it. But. All right. I'll be curious how many other 10s, if any, are to come. So maybe a long ways away before we get another one. So we'll see. Mm. All right. That'll do it here tonight, Scott. We'll be back in two weeks' time looking at the February 20th house show. we got three more uh, shows before Mania uh, 4 because mm-hmm. we'll be doing a special build as well. So we're getting close. A lot going on. We'll be back then in a couple of weeks with a returning guest that's uh, been with us in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had a new main event this past week, right? So you're off now for a week here. Yes, we are off. We're off this week. Next week we will uh, we'll recap Fastlane, which is of course this coming Sunday, and we'll do our next TNA uh, Classic pay per view recap. So yes, we're off this week. But we'll be back next week. All right, we do believe uh, this Wednesday. Hopefully, it will be a new Wrestling War Zone in your house. Five, me and Chad, and then rumors are swirling on the internet of No Holds Barred returning oh, uh, next really? week as well. So, mm-hmm. we'll see. Uh, Peter, anything you want to talk about? Uh, greetings to Allentown. Episode 105 dropped last week on Pro Wrestling USA from October 6, 1984. Bob Backlund with a creepy promo. It was taped in Memphis, so you get an interesting mix of talent because you have AWA, NWA, and Memphis guys all working on the same show, plus original commercials from 1984, one of which will blow your mind if you're under the age of 40 because you would not remember that unfortunately named product i'm not going to spoil it Hmm. and this thursday i have superstars of wrestling wwf style from november 22nd 1986 i almost said 1963 something else (laughs) happened that day and this is uh, ricky steamboat challenging the macho man randy savage and the Macho Man, and I know we've we've given him enough love on this show, but holy crap, I, I, I'm just going to sing his praises. For the month of November of 1986, oh. might be the greatest month that any, any champion ever had in the WWF. Yep. I would concur with that, Jim. Definitely. Look forward to listening. All right, so check this all Thursday. that out, plus all the stuff we mentioned earlier on both of our feeds and PlaceNation.com. And we're pursuing a podcast. Culture world. Follow us on social media. Please, number two, B Nation on Twitter, Facebook.com backslash Place B Nation, and of course, Bigelow34.proboards.com. Get your feedback and thoughts and comments there as well. Be sure to participate in the GWWE uh, Greatest Televised Pay Per View Match Ever Project. There's a Facebook group. If you search GWWE uh, Pay Per View or PPV slash TV matches, uh, you can search that out and join. Right now, we're still kind of in the nomination pro- process, but also some discussion going on on the message board as well. So basically we'll be picking the top 100 televised slash pay-per-view matches of all time. This year, you have all the way to the end of the year uh, to nominate and be involved in that. So be sure to take part in it. Uh, So for Scott and Peter, I'm Justin. We're out. We'll talk to you in two weeks' time. Everyone take care and be sure you understand the type of love between you and your friends. Bye.